Good. So I guess we are ready for the last part of today. We are going to have Christian uh, talk now. Afterwards, uh, Shubham Tulsiani. And then we're going to have a fantastic uh, panel discussion over here. Be prepared to ask uh, the most challenging questions that come to your mind at the panel. Uh, you can already start thinking about it. We are going to have uh, Christian Ruprecht now, a departmental lecturer from Oxford, a famous VDG group. And I guess we are going to hear about ponies today. No, maybe we'll see. Okay, so we, we are very much looking forward to your talk, Christian. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. I can hear myself as well. So it will maybe take a little bit of time to get used to the echo. Bear with me during that time. So what I want to talk about today is about extracting supervision from generative models and different ways how we can do that. And that is based in the general context of my slides is not working. Now, yes. So in computer vision, we are interested in this general image understanding problem. So we're looking at images like in this uh, painting over there, and we're trying to figure out what is the structure in the visual data. But in fact, what is happening is that this image has been generated as a picture of the real world out there. So we should actually be looking at um, how to cover the structure of the world from the visual data that we have. So we want to extract how the world works from the images of the world that we have. And one way this might look like is uh, like this. So you're looking at this image of a lion. And from that image, we want to extract as much as possible about the world. And that could be, for example, the shape, the material, the motion, light, physics, 2D segmentation, all sorts of underlying properties of this image and that scene that then come together to generate this image. And this is a very difficult problem because annotating these geometric and physical priors is very, very difficult. Here is a video of the capturing or the making of, of the uh, new Avatar movie. And you can see that they went through a huge effort to um, collect all the data that they needed to then render this movie and the characters within it in um, high detail. So they're capturing the facial expressions, 3D motion of the joints. Everyone is wearing these, these nice little dots that can be tracked very nicely and so on. But um, especially in the kind of academic university setting, it is impossible to do this for the whole world and it is very difficult to capture everything in like this. And this becomes clear when we're looking at the kind of data we're working is, with. So for example, there's thousands of different animal species that all look very differently. They are arranged differently, um, have different amount of limbs and so on. Then we're talking about everyday scenes, pictures of objects that are somewhat artificial generated. There is millions and billions of different objects with different functions, different appearance, different viewpoints. And then we're talking about scenes where all these objects come together and all are arranged in different fashions. And we want to understand all of this. And it's gonna be very, very difficult to do this with supervised models because going out there and annotating all of these things will be very, very hard. So the talk today will talk about how we can use generative models to solve at least some parts of these problems of understanding the world um, without supervision. And over the last maybe five years, we've been using generative models in very different settings. And there have been different evolutions of generative models from BAEs to GANs and diffusion models very recently. But there have been general ideas how we can use these models to improve the tasks we are interested in. And those ideas have not really changed. And today we'll talk about three of these and also these different ideas have appeared in, in a lot of the previous talks that we've already heard today. So the first idea is to solve the task directly. That's maybe the most straightforward idea of gener uh, using a generative model is you take it and you just train it on the task that you want to solve and um, then you're basically done. Second one is to use a generative model uh, that somebody else has trained or you have trained 
and then you apply it as a prior to the task you're actually solving. And uh, Philip's talk was um, very much on that side of things. And the third part that is now relatively new is how we can use these models to generate training data for our tasks. And that, uh, and Philip also showed that in his talk earlier, is something that I've seen now started to work. So we can now use these very new generative models to generate training data. And that seems to be a very good way to, to train algorithms where it's, for example, difficult to collect data or it's very expensive to collect data. So for the rest of this talk, I will go through each one of uh, these three ways to use generative models and show a very typical example of how this could work. I will start with um, directly solving a task with generative models. And this slide is kind of useless now that I've seen all the previous talks. So this is the general um, slide of introducing diffusion models. So we'll go through this very quickly in the sense that um, in this work, we're using diffusion models in a very pr pragmatic way. Um, so a diffusion model is a way of generating image, starting from Gaussian noise. And then you're, instead of learning this in one step, you're doing a lot of small steps to solve this task. So you take your image, you gradually noise it, which is called the diffusion process. And then what we're actually learning is the reverse diffusion process that goes from the noise to the data. And for the next work that I'm going to talk about, we were just looking at this pipeline and we were looking at this in a kind of iterative procedure where you're basically just applying a model to gradually improve the estimate of the result you want to have. And we were looking at one problem that is a very long standing problem in, in computer vision, which is structure for motion, where we're trying to given a set of images, trying to both reconstruct the underlying world and also the camera poses that come with it. And if you look at this pipeline that comes from Colmap, but is basically the same since the last 20 years um, with various changes in the components, it, you see in the blue part, this loop that goes through gradually improving the estimate of the camera poses and the 3D model. And we were thinking that this somehow matches the setup of a diffusion model. So what we came up with is relatively simple and straightforward. We call it pose diffusion. And it is basically a model where you feed in a collection of images. And this model then denoises a set of camera poses over all these images, and then gives you basically as a sample from this distribution, it gives you the set of camera poses for this image. And this is basically as trained as everyone would train a diffusion model. So you start have ground truth poses for these images and then you gradually noise them and use that to train your diffusion model. And this works reasonably well. So you here you can see from the Co3D data set that Vincent mentioned earlier as well. Um, here you see the diffusion process animated. So you go from a set of completely noisy camera poses just through the process and you um, iteratively refine this. And what I find very interesting about this method is basically that it works because what we're doing here is we're, we're taking the image, we're extracting a single dyno feature for this image. And then we feed that to a transformer that basically just does the diffusion process. And this model does know, doesn't know anything about geometry or any of the other things that we've been using for many, many years in, in pose estimation, but it still gives you relatively accurate camera poses. On the other hand, this setup is somewhat unsatisfying because we are throwing away all of the uh, nice ideas about cameras and reprojections that we've had in the past decades. So we were thinking, is there a way to bring back geometry into this currently completely learned framework? And luckily there is. So in the standard image diffusion models, what people do is called guidance. So for example, classifier guidance is if you have a classifier that is trained to recognize what is in the image, then you can use it to update the sampling process to move more towards 
the samples you like. So if you want to sample an image of a dog, then you move your sample towards uh, the direction where your classifier says this is an image of a dog. We could can do the same here, and we use that to bring back geometry into this process. So we extract 2D matches from the images, and then we use some epipolar geometry to compute an error of how well the reprojection of the points matches uh, across different frames, given the current camera poses in the diffusion process. And then we can say, this is basically the same as uh, a probability of how well the current camera poses match to the distribution of the images. And we can use that to guide the sampling using 2D matches. And here are some more examples um, of this process then. So this is now the combined model that basically uses both matches and the standard learned diffusion process to estimate the camera poses here. And one nice thing about uh, uh, this kind of sampling based model is that you can draw multiple samples from this model and you get an estimate about the uncertainty in the camera poses for, for the given views. So this is the, my example for how you basically take a task, you have annotated 3D camera poses from another method, and then you just train a diffusion model to solve this task. This is often not possible um, if you don't have the right annotations or if you don't have the capacity. Is, is that me? The ship is leaving. Okay, so it's not me. Perfect. So if anybody needs to catch a ship, now is the time. Um, Yes, so the second part of the talk is how we can use the generative models that maybe other people have trained and exploit them to solve the tasks that we're interested in. And this section is generative models as priors. Now, we've done this with GANs and with VLEs in the past, and but now that we have diffusion models, we're also interested in, in doing this with a new technology, but the general setup is always the same. So basically you have a model that um, generates some data. And in this task that we're looking at here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to generate uh, a 3D estimate given a single image. So single image 3D estimation. So, okay, yes. Um, we have a generator that generates an image that, um, and in this case, we generate a 3D representation and then we can render an image from that. And now we want to use a diffusion model as a prior to improve this current estimate, to improve this generator. And usually how this is done now, um, which is called um, the SDS uh, loss, is you add noise to your image, you use your diffusion model to denoise this image, which brings this image that you have generated closer to the data manifold um, that it was trained on, probably giving you a better image. And then you just use that as a target for your generator. And this finding from, from the paper that I've cited here um, or, and others is, is very, very useful to um, do this. And DreamFusion has used this for generating 3D models from text. And one thing that's very practical about this approach is that you don't need to compute gradients for the diffusion model. And of course you can do this for any kind of that you want. All of this is very generic. Since we are interested in generating a 3D model for a given image, what we need to do here is when we're trying to use a generative model like stable diffusion is we need to um, figure out how the text conditioning works. And we're using a process that is called textual inversion, which is relatively well known for now. So we are starting with an image and then we want to learn a new word that represents the concept that is in this image. So we call this um, new token that we're learning E, for example. And then what you do in this textual inversion is you give this sentence an image of an E, which E is the new token that you're learning to a text encoder. And then you condition your diffusion model on this. You add noise to the image, you denoise, but the only thing you're learning is this new token E. 
And then you train this with all sorts of different noises and augmentations of this image. And then your token E learns basically a representation of this image. And to see that this really captures the essence of the image, here's the original image. We have run this inversion. And then I'm sampling new images from the diffusion model with this new token that I've learned. And you can see that in each case, you get basically a similar image to what you have trained with. Now we can use this to use stable diffusion to supervise a 3D generative process. So what we're going to do is we want to take this image and generate a 3D model out of it. So we use the image with the process I've explained before. You compute your embedding, and then you do the following. You sample a bunch of random camera poses in your space, and you choose your favorite 3D representation. In our case, we use an instant NGP. And then you have two losses. One is you pick one view as the original view, and that you just supervise with the original image. And the other views you'd supervise with uh, the stable diffusion loss conditioned on your embedding E in the way that I've shown before. And then you basically train your NERF just with this supervision, and you get a reasonable reconstruction for this image that from the original viewpoint looks exactly like the conditioning image. And then from the other images, um, it looks like stable diffusion thinks this object should look like. Here's a couple of examples of how this works. Of course, it's, it's not perfect, but given that we are basically not doing any training here, we're just exploiting the diffusion model that somebody else has trained, um, their reconstructions are quite nice. Of course, there are several interesting aspects about this model. One is that this, what I've presented now, is optimization only. So there's no learning required after somebody else has trained a diffusion model, of course. And there are several tricks there um, that I haven't talked about. But if you come to the poster, this paper is in the main conference, we, we can talk about it there. It's mainly about regularization, how you make this stick together and not diverge into some strange uh, solutions. But I think what is most interesting is that always when we're using a drip model as a prior for a task, we're automatically inheriting all the biases that this model has been trained with. And especially common with internet pictures when, when people, for example, take pictures of their uh, pets is that the face is always visible. So if we run this model on an image like this, you can see that um, the dog has three heads in this reconstruction, just because stable diffusion basically prefers to see a face of a dog in, in every reconstruction. So if you use that to supervise it, then you, you sometimes get these kind of artifacts. Of course, we are not the only ones that have been working on this topic, and because this is in the wake of models that came out of the stable diffusion and 3D combination. So there's lots of different variants of basically the same goal with different flavors, using captions, using um, training a generator, using a generator, and so on and so forth. Now, the final part of the talk uh, will be on the third way to exploit generative models, which is now something that I haven't really seen before. and only started now that we have really good image generators. And that is basically using generative models to generate training data for our algorithms. And one interesting direction that I have been looking at in this space is open vocabulary segmentation, which is basically the tasks of given an image you want to segment anything. And since this has become almost a trademark term, I have to now qualify this in the sense that um, in this setting, you are given an image and a user tells you what they want to have segmented. So this looks something like this. This is a set of random images. And now we want to segment whatever uh, we want in, in these images. So that could be just normal things like boat, water, sky, or Darth Vader, or very specific uh, characters or, or things. And then what we would like is to the model to give us an output like this. And how this works for us is uh, like this. So we have an image and 
we have the input of what we want to segment in this image. And the first thing we do is we generate support images. And we do this in the maybe most naive case. So there's no prompt tuning or anything. So we just use the prompt, a good picture of A, and then we insert whatever word we want to uh, generate the images from. And then we have a very simple nearest neighbor lookup for, for segmentation. So to see how this works is I've, I've used this image now to to show some examples. As I said, we use stable diffusion to, to generate images for the support set. So this is 64, I think, samples of a, a good picture of a boat prompt. And you can see that you get a very good variety of boat examples in this case. And of course, you can do this with water, with sky, with mountains, and whatever other prompt you're interested in. And then the rest of the method is relatively simple. So we use a kind of foreground background segmentation method. These have become quite good, even though they're unsupervised. And we segment the image into foreground, background, and areas that we don't, are not really sure about. And um, we use that to generate what we call prototypes. So this works like this. So we have the prompts, we generate our support images. And um, in addition to basically generating these segmentation maps for each support image, we use a pre-trained feature extractor, for example, Dino works very well, which we have seen in, in many publications. And then we can generate prototypes for foreground parts of the image and for background parts of the image by just averaging all the features within each mask. We do this separately for all the prototypes, uh, all the classes that we want to segment. And now, given a new image that we want to segment, we just run the same feature extractor as before. And for each patch that we're looking at, we're just comparing, retrieving the nearest neighbor uh, in our database that we have generated out of uh, these prototypes and just using the label um, for segmentation. And there are two things that you can improve there. One is that um, what we're doing is not only extracting foreground and background masks and computing prototypes. We also, in addition to that, run k-means across all the images, all the features and all the images and get additional prototypes just using k-means that gives us more fine-grained, almost like parts uh, prototypes of the images. But that's also fully supervised. Uh, unsupervised, of course. Um, and then finally, if you have a very large set of potential things you want to segment, then what we found is quite useful is to use clip as a pre-filtering step to decide what classes could be in the image and um, basically restrict the set of prototypes to um, only the set that could be in the image. And with that, you can, without any training, this is basically just generating images and nearest neighbor lookup uh, in feature space. You can segment basically anything that you can name in an image and it works reasonably well. And one interesting aspect of this is that you can use get the prototypes to get explanations. So I can highlight a part in an image and then look up the images that contain the prototype that is closest to this and get an explanation of why the model thinks this should be segmented as a dog. And you can see that this highlights parts and, and aspects in the support images that look very similar to the segmentation that we're getting. Now for the final part of the talk, I want to come back to the beginning where I said, what I'm really, really interested in is how to understand the world and all the factors that make up an image. And there's a line of work that we've been going at for about five years now that is basically trying to use in the wild images and videos to understand the 3D structure of the world. And here we are basically inverting the rendering process in the sense that we're taking an image and we want to extract all these kind of physical 3D properties of the world. And we've termed this general setup as photogeometric auto encoding, where we're basically setting the whole thing up as a reconstruction problem 
um, where we're trying to reconstruct the input image, but we're training a model that inside decomposes the image into all of these components. And throughout these five years, we've always needed to inject inductive biases about how the world works into this process. And there are several different ways we've done this. We've done it with videos, with optical flow. Um, we have a paper at the main conference that uses self-supervised features to do this, where we basically do segmentation and some feature extraction. And then we're learning a model that um, goes from a single image to an articulated 3D mesh that uh, reconstructs uh, this individual instance. So this is a learned model that in a single forward pass does this. I don't have time to talk about how this works, but we've done a follow-up work that fits into the category of generating training data, where in the original work, we basically collected 10,000 images of horses to train this model on. So these are it's still an unsurprised work in the sense that we were just training on images of horses and that was the only supervision we've been using. However, we have to collect 10,000 images of horses. So what we're doing now is we're trying to replace these images of horses with just generating images of horses using stable diffusion. And we use this generated training data. So we replace all the real images only with generated images and we're also, again, using this SDS idea where you're noising your image and then running it through a denoising diffusion model to use a, a additional supervision. And that slots right into this framework that is basically the same to the, to the work we're presenting at the main conference now. But the good thing about this is that now we basically can get completely rid of the data collection process and can train this model on any category of images that we can use, that we can generate. So we can now expand this from the horses we've trained on to we have pigs and uh, dogs and sheep. And um, it still works basically exactly as well as if you have trained on real data. And I think what's also cool is that since these generative models can generate these crazy things, then now we can also use them to generate crazy training data and we can build models that um, work on these kind of images that we wouldn't see in the real world. And it would be very difficult to collect uh, 10,000 images of cow made out of fruits. But of course, if we have a generative model, we can train for anything. And then if you're trying to, I don't know, video game out of, for fruit cows, then you can use a method like this. And yeah, here are some examples of this model. So it basically just works in a single forward pass, takes an image, gives you an articulated 3D model, and all of this is trained only on synthetic data from stable diffusion. Here's some sheep. Okay, this brings me to the end of the talk. If my slide works, yes, there. So I've talked about basically the three main ideas that I think are independent of the type of generative model and how to use them for downstream vision tasks that we have found very useful. One is you just solve the task directly, which might be sometimes difficult in terms of training, supervision of the model. But of course, this is a valid approach. Then you can use them as priors to use a model that somebody else has trained on a large scale, and you extract the information and put it into the model you are training. And now what has become being possible with the new quality, high quality generations is that you can actually generate training data for um, a lot of different tasks that are possible. Good. Thank you very much for your attention. And then I would be happy to take some questions. Thanks, Christian, for this fantastic talk. We are going to have uh, Mike here, as always. And up until someone raises his hand, I'm going to ask questions. Does it also work for cats? I that's mean that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> somebody at some point said, Cats are the bane of computer vision. And 
cats, we have not tried yet. I'm looking at the people that worked with me on this project. I don't think we have tried cats. So I don't think this is a problem of the generative model, which is, I think is more a problem of the underlying method that we use for single image 3D because of I would say maybe three different factors. One is that cats are very fluffy and we're using a Lambertian model at the moment for shading and, and that really doesn't work well also with the mesh that we're learning. Um, the second point I think that is very difficult is that the variance in cats is very, very high. Horses basically always look the same. I hope there's, <laughs> people might be upset about this, but I think there's a more, more variety in cats than there is in horses, in, just in terms of shape and articulation that, that is possible there. So that, that is a factor. And then I think the third factor, which is maybe related, is that um, these horse images you get usually relatively often the whole body of the horse. And that is, for the current method, very, very important that you see the whole object, at least. And um, there's not too many self occlusions and so on. Thanks. Questions? I see a question there. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. So I no noticed that you have uh, um you have used the, the proponent like the a uh, good photo of call to generate the uh, some uh, preliminary data for the pipeline. So I'm um, I'm I'm wondering how about some more careful proponent proponent design like um a good photo of call from the back view from the front view from side views so that we can have a um much rich collection of the data for your uh, pipeline? Yes, that, that's a very good point. So for the last work that I showed, this is exactly what we're doing. So there we're actually doing a bit of prompt tuning and we're also basically adding this viewpoint um, into the queries that we're generating. So we say we want a photo from the back, photo from the front. Um, this works sometimes. Stable diffusion, I think is not the best in following these prompts, probably because there's um, not enough training data in in Lion that has, I don't know, pictures of horses from the back. We would really, for this model, we also would like to have, I don't know, from the bottom to get the, the reconstruction, but nobody takes these pictures. So if you ask Stable Diffusion to generate an image of a horse from the bottom, you, you just get an image of a horse. Um, so this is a point where you're kind of limited partially by the kind of prompt tuning you're doing, but also partially by what you can generate. But uh, it's a very good point. So this we do this, and it does help uh, the performance. One more uh, question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so my question is regarding comparing uh, your um, generation training data with simulation efforts. So there's a lot of efforts on the simulation side to generate assets that you can then use and add to different images to create, to train for any task. And how do you envision those two uh, methods will compare in the future? Yes, this uh, is a very good question. And at the moment we are looking into simulation, especially for evaluation, because it's really difficult to evaluate if you have reconstructed the right model um, in the real world, because nobody goes and scans a cow um, with a 3D scanner. Um, so in that sense, there we are using that. In the work that we've been doing, I think it's a kind of a two-part way why we haven't used simulation yet. One is this kind of academic idea. We want to try to do it as easily as possible with as little supervision as we can. And if you basically spend the effort of generating 3D assets, um, then you can just use that. You don't need to train a model then that predicts those again, basically. And uh, the second part is that it's still relatively expensive to hire 
artists to um, generate this data that you then can use to to train your data on. So I think there is a reasonable space that where you want to actually do this um, purely on kind of generated data using I don't know a generative model because that's relatively simple. You basically just for for the model now you just type what category you want and then can just let it go and it generates data, trains the model, and then you get get the result out, um, which is quite interesting. I think. For the sake of time, we need to stop here. Sorry for that. Thank uh, you very thanks much. Thanks again, Christian. Fantastic talk.